Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Robert O'Dowd. I come from Ireland, but I uh, live in Leon and work at the University of Leon in northern Spain. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, that I've been allowed to speak to you today by video as I wasn't able to attend in person, I'm afraid. And I'm, I'd like to thank the organizers for, for allowing me to talk to you in this way. Uh, I, I've only got about 25 minutes or so to talk to you, so I'm going to get straight to the point. Um, let me share my screen first of all. And here we are now. So uh, I'm talking to you today um, about virtual exchange and blended mobility. This is a, a topic that I've been studying for the for all my academic career, basically. I did my PhD all about virtual exchange at the University of Essen in Germany uh, over 20 years ago. And ever since then, I've been studying this fascinating uh, part of, um, of international education. Uh, I'm, however, I'm here today very much um, not trying to sell you this as a panacea, trying to tell you that this is the solution to all our problems, that this is the next step for international education, and that we're not going to need to travel anymore, and that we don't need to send our students abroad anymore. I am also a product of Erasmus. Uh, I, did, uh, I had wonderful experiences studying abroad when I was at college, and I'm convinced that this is a necessary part of students um, university uh, careers if if and when possible however i think that we as we all know many students are never going to go abroad uh, for di for many different reasons and we also know that in times of of pandemics such as covid the you know the options offered to us by online and um, virtual exchange um, are really exciting and important and useful so i think we need to explore them but what i'm going to do to today is uh, try to show you, shall we say, the potential for, uh, that virtual exchange has in particular for overcoming aspects of uh, inclusion and, you know, including groups of students that wouldn't normally travel abroad. And But at the same time, I'm also going to look at the challenges and the barriers that it poses, okay, and the things that we need to consider, okay? So I'm going to try and look at both sides of it. And then also maybe, you know, so, well, let me just con continue my 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 presentation here uh, these are basically what i'd like to do you know begin by talk about what is virtual exchange or what is blended mobility because there are a lot of different terms out there and they can be very confusing because they're being used interchangeably and different terms mean you know they have different meanings and involve different activities and it's good to clarify i think what we need what we what we mean by each of these then i'm going to talk a little bit about virtual exchange and how it can support diversity and inclusion in university education. And, but then I'll move on, I'll talk about the barriers and limitations of virtual exchange and what we need to keep in mind as we start taking up this type of activity in our classrooms. And then if I have time, and I hope I will, we'll look at what steps can, we can take to promote the uptake of virtual exchange and blended mobility. Okay, so, so practical steps that we can undertake there. So, um, a quick review, first of all, of definitions, all right? I think it's important to differentiate between virtual exchange and virtual mobility, okay? These are two very different activities, and we need to, um, you know, differentiate and understand clearly what we're talking about. And then secondly, we need also to be aware of what we mean by blended mobility and what everybody in Europe seems to be talking about nowadays is BIPs. And what are BIPs, okay? So let's see, you know, what we mean by all of these things. Well, first of all, what is virtual exchange? Now, I, there are colleagues there with you today that I'm sure will have made slightly different definitions or will put different emphasis on different things. But my definition of virtual exchange, the one that I work with, and the one that I think captures most of the key points, is that it is an umbrella term that talks about, that looks at different ways learners are brought into online intercultural interaction and collaboration together with partners from other cultural contexts or from other uh, countries and geographical regions, but also very importantly, as an integrated part of coursework and under the guidance of educators. Now, I imagine most of you today, if I'd ask you before this presentation, what is virtual exchange? You would definitely tell me this first part. It's about bringing classes of learners uh, from different parts of the world into online collaboration and interaction together. However, uh, I think it, you also need to keep, keep in mind the second part, that it should be an integrated part of coursework, so students should get recognition for their work, for what they do, and it should take part as, you know, be related to their curriculum or to whatever they're studying in their classes. 
And also, very importantly, that teachers, educators, guide and support and facilitate students in these interactions. Because as I'm sure you're all aware by now, we may be all working with a, uh, uh, what we call digital natives, but that does not mean that our students are good online collaborators, collaborators, communicators, and, and you know, so we need to, to keep in mind that they need guidance. And especially in this very complex activity where you're bringing students into contact with people that speak different languages that come from other cultures. How do we get our students to learn from that? Okay, that's the role of the teacher that I want you to keep in mind there. Um, now, uh, terminology. So virtual exchange, like I said, is an umbrella term, but there's many other terms that you've probably heard. Probably the best known one and one that you'll probably hear a few times um, in, your, in your conference these days is COIL, right? The one in the bottom left there. Collaborative Online International Learning. This is a very, very common term uh, for an, a, one approach or one type of virtual exchange. If you're working in the world of economics and, and um, marketing, for example, they will often refer to global virtual teams. And for those of us that come from the world of foreign language education, well, telecollaboration and e-tandem, teletandem are all common terms as well. These are all different, more or less, you know, different ways that virtual exchange is put into practice. And they may differ in certain ways, but they, I think they are all, you know, they all can, we can all say that they are forms of virtual exchange. However, we cannot confuse or should not confuse virtual exchange with virtual mobility. Okay. Now, virtual mobility is something that m many of you will have seen happening during um, the COVID lockdown, for example. Okay. Where students attend classes for a short period at another institution outside of their own country without physically leaving their home. So students would, you know, I, I was an Erasmus coordinator in my, in my department and students, instead of traveling abroad during COVID because they were not able to, they were able to register online at a foreign university. They followed the classes, <clears throat> pardon me, online um, <clears throat> through video lectures and through the online platforms. They studied the content, they did the exams online as well. And then at the end, Usually the university, uh, the partner university sent back the grades to my, to my university and said the student had passed the exams, et cetera, et cetera. That is what we mean by virtual mobility. Virtual exchange, like I've been saying, is very different to this, okay? You've got your students, they continue as part of their normal classes. And as part of their normal classes, they are taking part in projects. They are engaging in, in interaction with students that are, in other countries, in other classes as well. And they are collaborating online together. Okay, so there you can see kind of a, a you know, the main differences between these two, two approaches. Okay, um, virtual mobility. Uh, I won't be talking about that today because it's not my area of, of, of expertise. All I know is that it is a very controversial term. Um, as some of the colleagues that are maybe there today will, all, will later mention to you. I mean, the fact that people question whether it should be called mobility at all. OK, and there's a lot of interesting research coming out about it now. This is just one example, this article that I came across very recently, which are, you know, questioning the, the students, the quality of the students' experiences by engaging in virtual mobility. Because as many colleagues will point out, um, you know, going abroad, attending classes is only one small part of the of the study abroad experience. OK, <laughs> they, they also you also go to post offices. Well, nobody goes to post offices anymore, but. You go to bakeries, you go to shops, you meet people inside class, outside of the classroom, uh, in, your res in your student residence. All of that is part of student of study abroad. So simply by providing online courses to follow, you know, the, that experience pales, um, you know, in comparison to what is a real Erasmus or study abroad experience. And that, I think, is what <clears throat> this research published, uh, which has just been published, and others are showing up. Okay. Anyway, next step, what is blended mobility? Blended mobility can be defined as the strategic combination of both physical mobility and structured online collaboration. That means you're combining uh, stages of virtual exchange where students are collaborating online together with a period of short physical mobility in one of the, of the partner's universities, okay? Uh, the most well-known or most common approach to blended mobility that we have now in Europe thanks to the new Erasmus Plus program, 
are blended intensive programs, BIPs. And BIPs, like I said, part of the new Erasmus Plus program. And what they involve is, as you can see here, physical mobility between five and 30 days, combined with a compulsory virtual component. And notice this, facilitating collaborative online learning exchange and teamwork. So virtual exchange, okay? And these blended mobilities must have, have a minimum of three ECTS. And to give you an example of a, of a BIP, in case you, some of you are not familiar with them yet, this is one that we carried out in my own university in my own classes uh, last year. It was, <clears throat> the subject was innovation in foreign language teaching. So these were uh, groups of future foreign language teachers from different countries. Okay, it was, it was worth three ECTS. And the students were my students in, in Leon in Spain, <clears throat> colleagues from, uh, students from Bochum in Germany, from Trinity College in Ireland, from Oulu in Finland, and also from universities in Italy and Lithuania. How did it work? Well, we had three phases. The first one was, shall we say, online lectures where we invited guest speakers and students could log on, follow them, and then meet afterwards and discuss with a prepared worksheet, you know, what, what happened in, in the lecture. We then gave them projects to do where they had to work in these international teams and collaborate and prepare a project uh, based on the topics they had been listening to. And then finally, after Christmas, um, just after Christmas, after maybe six to eight weeks working online together, they they traveled to Leon and they all met together. Uh, we had organized cultural events. They finished the projects they had started in phase two. They presented them. And that's what it we all looked like on the last day of our course. All very tired, but very happy. Really exciting and uh, I think very promising approach to um, virtual exchange and international education. There are, um, it's now, today's not the, the, the day to go into it. There's lots of limitations to these big programs, lots of problems about how they're being set up, but we'll, uh, we'll look at that maybe another day. Okay, but anyway, today, what I wanted to look at a little bit is about this whole issue of diversity and an inclusion in virtual exchange, okay? So that covers two issues. First of all, the potential for the greater inclusion of underrepresented social and cultural groups in international learning. We all know that there are many groups that never get to go abroad, okay? And the new Erasmus program, you know, is asking us to focus on, you know, uh, to promote equal opportunities of access, inclusion, diversity, and fairness across all its actions. And, you know, virtual exchange, I think, can be seen as a potentially useful tool for doing this for giving students that wouldn't normally go abroad access to international learning experiences. However, there's a second issue I want us to consider, right? Which is the whole issue of the quality of the engagement of our students. So once we get our students involved in these varsity exchanges, how do they engage with the other groups? Um, um, to, to what extent is there equity of engagement? between the different groups that are taking part in these projects. And I'll try and explain what I mean by that in a, in a couple of minutes, right? Um, I mean, like I said, it's pretty obvious why we can link virtual exchange, I think, to inclusion, okay, and diversity. All you have to do is look at the current rates of international student mobility in Europe, okay? Uh, I, I don't know if I, you guys are familiar with what percentage of students in your country go abroad. But if we look at the EU average, we've got only 13.5% of students, okay? That's 9.1% uh, that are doing, you know, certain a stage like Erasmus or something like that, and 4.3% that are actually studying, doing their, all of their studies in another country. Maybe you can see from that, it's very difficult maybe to read on your screen uh, the different countries, um, you know, but the, the big, shall we say, the su most successful countries seem to be Luxembourg, Cyprus, the Netherlands, Germany, and Finland in descending order. Okay, so that's it. So, you know, these are the, so we would say, okay, so then obviously, you know, we should be considering virtual exchange for those students that that's 87% um, that are never going to go abroad, right? But, you know, there is, any, there is a lot of critique in the literature of, you know, physical mobility being a form of exclusion, okay? Even though we have taken for granted for so many years that this is the way we need to internationalize our classes and internationalize our universities. Uh, there's a really wonderful book that I, rec I really recommend to you by a lady called Sarah Richardson, Cosmopolitan Learning for Global Area. And, and she is very critical of physical mobility in this book. She says, mobility tends to be socially exclusive 
providing opportunities to elite students to enhance their distinctiveness from other students, but remaining inaccessible to many. So it simply makes the elite even more elite, basically, is what she's saying there. And she calls on institutions and policymakers to turn their attention away from a myopic focus on movement as the holy grail in helping students to gain a global ethos. I really like that. Um, a myopic focus on movement as the holy grail, right? So in other words, institutions have, have you know, have only one vision about how to get students a global ethos, how to develop into cultural competence, how to develop global citizenship. And that was send them abroad and let them work it out while they're out there, right? And she questions that very nicely. She argues very strongly for this in this book. And it's a really, like I said, really recommendable book. So um, there is now, because of this, there is, shall we say, within the literature and within all of the organizations that promote virtual exchange, there are a lot of them are now looking um, for, to see if, you know, virtual exchange can be a tool for inclusion of non-mobile students. And the Stevens Initiative, which is a, a very important organization in the United States that looks at this whole area, uh, they suggest that um, they have found in, in their data, okay, that, for example, more than half of all respondents that took part in their virtual exchanges, okay, they engage normally, by the way, students in the United States and in the MENA regions, okay, um, more than half of them identified their race or ethnicity as something other than white, 11% as having a disability, and 30% as being first-generation students. So what they're trying to point out here is basically, you know, that, um, that they are attracting students to virtual exchange programs that wouldn't normally have an international experience. In, in the summer and fall of 2021, 65% of MENA and 78% of U.S. respondents had not previously participated in an international exchange, okay? So, you know, this is data to prove that students that would normally, that would never go abroad are getting at least some kind of international learning experience through virtual exchange. And this is something that Euro uh, the European Commission picks up on. And one of the main justifications for BIPs, for blended intensive programs and for blended mobility is this, you know, the, the, the commission says at its core, blended mobility creates new learning opportunities for people who could not participate in a mobility program before, in particular students from different backgrounds, including those with fewer opportunities. The assumption here, and I'm insisting it's an assumption because there's no data, by the way, yet to prove this, is that students that wouldn't normally go abroad would get, you know, because they can't afford to stay away for six months or for nine months will be able to take part in, um, in BIP programs, for example, and other forms of blended mobility. Okay, that is the assumption. It's also a thing we can look for, not only with students, but for teachers, okay? That there are, you know, many, many teachers that who should be going abroad, who should be, you know, getting a global experience as part of their teaching career and are not able to do it, right? And that may be because, um, you know, especially those in, in, shall we say, in rural areas and isolated areas, okay? They have limited access to specialized expertise. There's difficulties attending workshops. You know, there's very few workshops and training programs being organized in their own institutions. Well, in a in a project which I've been leading recently called v Valiant, which is it comes from virtual innovation and support networks for teachers. OK, what we have tried to do is to organize virtual exchanges that bring together teachers in isolated areas, student teachers in, in universities of education and educational experts in virtual exchanges together. And we've brought them together here, as you can see, in different ways. Uh, some of the virtual exchanges only involved in-service teachers, others in mixed in-service teachers and student teachers, and others only involved student teachers. But uh, one of the things is that we see that virtual exchange was felt as or perceived as a way of overcoming isolation. Yeah? Um, you know, we're getting feedback like this. Participating in a virtual exchange made me feel part of a wider community you know, very high uh, re uh, positive reaction to this. Participating in a virtual exchange made me feel more connected with other teachers. All of these type of comments are being, you know, uh, strongly agreed with, All right? So this is, I think, a very positive op option for virtual exchange. And I'll let you look here very briefly at some of the comments from the teachers that took part in these valiant exchanges.
Okay, so you, I think you can see the you know the value of this for teachers that are not used to to getting access to international experiences, to international collaborators, to actually international networks. You know, virtual exchange can be a very a powerful tool there. Okay, virtual exchange has also been seen to be what we would call a safe space for foreign language learners. For those of you that are teaching in 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 areas of Europe where maybe students are not used to using English or foreign languages outside of the classroom, virtual exchange can be a very powerful first step into the world of communicating and using language in real contexts. Uh, again, these are just some ex um, comments this time from students that took part in the Valiant Exchanges that aren't used to, you know, using English or using a foreign language in their day-to-day -day lives, you know. It's been a great experience that has made me more confident about interacting with people from abroad. I can say that it helps me practice the speaking skill. I have social phobia and I get nervous when talking to a group. The project helps me to overcome it. So, you know, this is the, I think, another great potential for this. And I have seen this. Uh, I do virtual exchanges with my students every year, my foreign language learners every year. And I can see this, this eureka movement, move, move, uh, moment when they realize that you know, that they can actually use English for more than simply doing grammar exercises or for writing essays, okay? Um, it also, of course, opens up an opportunity for to give students access to, to places in the world and to people in the world that they would never normally travel to, okay? And I think you can see that in the Stevens Initiative, but also in the Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange. They are focused on using virtual exchange to engage students from, um, shall we say, the Western world, with students from the Middle East and North Africa, okay, that's the case of, of the Stevens Initiative, and also uh, the Eras in the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange program that was working until very recently. Again, it was about engaging students from Europe with students from the Southern Mediterranean, okay, which is again a similar area, okay. And, you know, the, the, I mean, there's, there's a lot of research about this that shows that teachers tend to, um, you know, visit places. Um, you know, uh, well, I should read it here. In traditional in-person in international exchanges, um, Mandora et al. cautioned that faculty often consider the target country most practical to visit, so the safest, the closest, all right? So virtual exchange gives our, gives our students and gives our teachers an opportunity to engage with countries that normally you wouldn't have access to. And the European and the Erasmus Plus program does offer funding now for what they call virtual exchanges with specific regions. And those specific regions in, in the 20, 2021 call was the sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Okay. Finally, you know, one other important thing to point out, uh, another positive aspect is that <clears throat> virtual exchange could also lead students to want to study abroad. Okay, And there's this very large scale study, a very interesting one that came out recently that showed that um, the probability of studying abroad goes up from 6.4% to 14.1% after virtual exchange treatment. So, you know, students after being engaged in international virtual exchanges want to or become more interested in wanting to go abroad, okay? And that's a very large scale study that has de demonstrated that, okay? And again, I'm finding that in another project that we're, we're working with, uh, with, the, with the Dutch national government, we're, we're finding is that, you know, when you ask students following my virtual exchange, I'm now more interested in taking part in a physical international exchange. You know, a very large amount of them agree with this. Okay, so summarizing the potential for virtual exchange. Okay, what well, we have. Virtual exchange can be a tool for inclusion. Uh, it can be a way of overcoming isolation, whether it's for learners or teachers. It can be a safe place for foreign language learners. And it can open up virtually, uh, you know, students' classrooms to cultures and regions which they wouldn't normally access through physical mobility. And finally, virtual exchange can be a tool for motivating engagement in, in physical mobility in the future. Okay. However, however, and there's always a however in these things. Uh, challenges to diversity. There's certain problems, barriers that we have to be aware of, okay? Can virtual exchange hinder engagement in, in physical mobility? Well, lead, that, that large-scale study that I mentioned earlier also said that there was a danger that um, students might feel that by having taken part in a virtual exchange, they have ticked the box of intercultural and international experiences and they don't need to do any more, okay? There is a very big danger of this. 
Okay. Also, there is a, um, um, a certain fear among certain groups in Europe that virtual exchange could be used as, a as a, an excuse to reduce funding for physical mobility. And there's a very interesting paper that you can find online, a joint position paper by the European Students' Union and the Erasmus Student Network. And what they warn is this. They say, although quite popular in most policy documents, virtual mobility is an ambiguous and oxymoronic term. Uh, uh, mobility experience is by definition physical and not virtual. If no physical, mo mo physical movement has taken place, there is no need to call it mobility at all. And I bet you there are some colleagues there this morning in, in, in BLED that will uh, definitely agree with this statement. But what they point out also is that, uh, therefore, when counting participants in international mobility, participants in virtual activities should not be counted as mobile students, but as another category. And funding for these activities should not be taken from the budgets for student mobility. And I would agree totally with this. These are not to be con confused. They are not to be thrown into the same box. And we should be very aware of that. Okay. Um, also, and I'm very thankful to my to my my colleague Joe Bielan for for you know really bringing this up to me and and getting me to think about this. Virtual exchange is not also necessarily suited to all different types of learners. Okay. Um, in, when, when I discussed this with him and we produced this blog for the AIE, uh, we pointed out that virtual exchange is based on the principles of collaborative learning, okay, which is, may not be suited to all students, okay, and which teachers may not be familiar with. And also there's the whole issue of foreign language proficiency. Students may feel overwhelmed by the need to participate in video conferences with international students that may be more fluent with them or more used to international communication. Okay, and we have to keep this in, 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 take this into account. And again, I see this in my own classes, right? This is a, an, an, a really very revealing extract from a student portfolio that, that a student submitted to me a couple of years ago. She said that when she was reflecting on her exchange with Finnish, Dutch, and Polish partners, okay, and she said, during this meeting, I had some trouble communicating as I'm not used to speaking English, but I tried to do my best. However, when I saw the excellent level of English that the other students had, I felt insecure and didn't speak too much. I also had a lot of trouble understanding them as they spoke very fast and had very thick accents. So just like, like I said earlier, virtual exchange can be like a great first step into the world of intercultural communication. There are certain types of learners or those that have a certain level of proficiency in the foreign language that may not be able and not up to this. And this may be kind of have an, end up having a negative impact on them. Um, other, another very interesting article that we, I came across is this one, International Virtual Education Needs Greater Support. And Stelly Vieri is talking here about the Brazilian context. Okay, And she says, for Brazilians to make full use of virtual exchange, they would need to first overcome three gaps. The linguistic gap, okay, the one we've just been talking about, right, about being able to speak in, in, you know, in, in international languages. The digitalization gap, where there's a lack of good technology, something that maybe some of us take for granted nowadays, right? And the structural gap, the lack of institutional curricular flexibility and support for such initiatives. Because if you want teachers to do this and you want students to do this, institutions need to recognize this work. They need students need to get credit, teachers need to get support to, to, to learn how to do this. Okay. And all of the, all of so all of this must come together. Okay, in order for virtual exchange to work well, right? Another issue to keep in mind is this whole issue of video conferencing. We've become so used to video conferencing during during the the COVID lockdown, we sometimes forget that we're if we're asking students in virtual exchanges to take part in synchronous meetings, in Zoom meetings, in Google Meet, or in Teams, that these are you know, as this very interesting blog points out, they are biased against certain time zones. They are biased against, you know, they are culturally unaware. Okay, students might be obliged to meet during national holidays and things. They are biased against families and busy people, and they favor native speakers, of course. And, you know, whenever I show this, uh, you know, mention this to, uh, to teachers, then they all start telling me uh, lovely anecdotes of, well, almost sad anecdotes of, you know, students having to go out into balconies because their, their rooms are so busy, so full of people and so full of their families that they can't participate in class and things like that. I'm sure you guys know examples like this as well. And so in what the, the lesson here, I think, is that if we're going to do virtual exchange, keep in mind the value of text-based asynchronous communication, 
okay, forums, emails, okay? It doesn't all have to be by video conferencing. Okay, now my final point, this whole idea of virtual exchange um, um, being inclusive and accessible for our own students is one issue. But how, what about how we engage with other social and cultural groups? Because not everybody, not every two sets of students, when you bring them together, are going to be, shall we say, on the, on the same level, okay? Economically, socially, there's going to be cultural differences, there's going to be economic differences, and we have to keep this in mind. And the, the question of equity of engagement, right, is what, what this is known as. Um, you know, this there's a lovely book that has come out very recently called That School in the World, which has a lovely collection of articles or chapters about teachers not necessarily doing virtual exchange, but, you know, you know, trying to engage their students internationally in different ways. And there's one really interesting art, uh, chapter in there by, by colleagues called Agreement. Uh, and, and and her colleagues, and they say the following. They say that study abroad participants from the global north often initially reflect an attitude of coming to help instead of being more receptive to learning from their host communities. So when you're talking about engaging students from the global north, the United States, Europe, with students from the global south, wherever that may be, there is very often on an underlying attitude of coming to help, of coming to teach, OK, and you can see lots and lots of examples of this in virtual exchange projects as well. OK, and Betty Leask has pointed this out as well. She warns this in her in her in, um, her well-known book, Internationalizing the Curriculum. She said there's a very often a deficit model of diversity, OK, where, you know, students coming from uh, certain backgrounds, they are, you know, they, their their knowledge and their experience is treated almost at a second level and a second as a second class level in classrooms. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples of what I feel are, you know, are, you know, issue, you know, you know which show up issues of, of equity of engagement and virtual exchange. I'll let you know what you think, okay? Uh, sorry, you can, you can then let me know what you think. This is the first one, okay? This is an example from a virtual exchange between students in Palestine and the USA, all right? And here we have international teams of Palestinian and American engineering students working together to solve sustainability challenges and to develop a green building design for a Palestinian refugee camp. The designs were judged by a panel of experts in a final competition. And then the Palestinian students from the winning team traveled to the United States to meet their, their counterparts in, in America and learn about green buildings in the United States. Now, um, this sounds to me at first glance like a very nice global citizenship project where you have two groups of students working together to solve a real world problem, okay? Which is in this case, the need to design green buildings for a Palestinian refugee camp. But, you know, you also have on, on another level, Americans and Palestinians working to solve a Palestinian problem as if it was the, the Americans that, shall we say, that it was the Palestinian problem that needed to be resolved and there are no problems in the United States. Also, there is an issue there of the winning Palestinian students getting to travel to the United States. Someone, you know, might say, "Well, why not? Why not go the other way? Why, why not let the, the why not bring the United States students to Palestine?" Okay, so there's an issue here of equity. I I would suggest. And here's the second one. Let, let let's read this one for a second, and then I'll I'll come to a close because I see I'm running out of time. Um, an American group of learners exchange emails with a group from Quebec for over a year and a half in order to carry out various parallel learning projects. Each group was learning the other's language. Okay, so you had students in Quebec and students in the United States um, email each other at, uh, at, at the time, okay, in English and French, learning each other's languages. The exchanges reported to have worked extremely well, and the American groups are said to have considered their Quebecois partners very competent and highly proficient model learning, learning for models for learning French. Okay, so far, so good. Okay. It was not until the two groups met at the end of the exchange that the American students realized that their partner class actually consisted of deaf children. So the Quebecois students were actually deaf. Okay. Now, again, you see this for the, the first time and the author that tells this story for the first time is trying to show the value of the internet that people can engage without, you know, without initial stereotypes, 
okay, without initial bias, okay, and there's definitely that value to it. What I would question also is uh, are the issues that we may be almost hiding um, people's the way people are, okay. And if you're hiding the way people are, then you're not really helping to overcome stereotypes at all. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave these two examples with you. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure about that. You could say that these are, you know, questionable in the sense of equity of the way we engage. I'm just saying that these are the type of thorny issues of gray areas that are going to come up when you start engaging your students in these type of projects. Okay. Now, I'm going to um, go quickly through the end. I had lots of other things to tell you, but I'm running out of time, okay? I'm going to leave you with this. I'm going to leave you with uh, a bibliography, uh, which you can scan from this QR code and some available links if you want to read more about it, okay? Thank you very much for, for listening to me. I'm sorry, like I said, that this had to be a recorded uh, presentation. And if you want to follow up with any of the, the, the issues or the topics that I brought up today, please uh, drop me a line and let me know. Thank you very much indeed.